Hello and welcome to episode 45 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 3rd of September 2018. I'm Joe and with me are Phelim. Hello. Graham. Hello. And Will. Hello. Welcome back, Graham. Hope you had a good holiday. I did. It was fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, I saw a photo of you by the pool. Well, your view from the pool looked very inviting. Yeah, it was just um, just south of France. Nice weather, nice wine. Uh, I'm dreaming of that now. Now summer's over. All right, well, let's get straight on with the news. Um, this obviously has been put in by you, Phelim, these first couple anyway. The KDE Pinebook edition. So this is um, KDE Neon on a Pinebook, which is an ARM-based laptop. It is indeed, and a pretty cheap one at that, which is kind of scary how cheap you can get something that decent these days. I mean, you consider it's um, a quad-core 64-bit ARM CPU at 1.2 gigs with 2 gigs of RAM and a whole lot of storage on it. Yeah, I mean, it's only a 720p display, isn't it? Um, but it's still a laptop form factor, and that's all for $100 or $99. Wow. But the rub is you can't just buy one, can you? You have to... Uh, register your interest in buying one and then when they get enough people who want one they will then put an order in and ship it to people so i've very much got my order in and so yeah everyone do the same so that i can actually get one of these (laughs) not self-serving at all yeah but it looks really cool and i spoke to jonathan riddle about this um, a while ago and he said that plasma was running absolutely fine on it so it's very tempting. If Plasma does run fine on it, it might uh, finally convert me from XFCE. Yeah, right. No, but it might on that device. I'd love to have, and I've wanted an ARM laptop for ages. Something that's not. Uh, you can get Raspberry Pi powered ones, but I think the Pine board at the uh, the Pine sixty four board is a little bit more powerful than uh, the Raspberry Pi um, because it's well, it's got more RAM for a start off. It's got two gigabytes of RAM, which makes a massive difference from one. That is incredible value for money. And I wonder what the battery life is going to be like. I mean, it could potentially be really good and perfect for just taking on the road somewhere for typing up and some browsing. Yeah, I guess it depends how much of that case is battery um, because there's potentially a lot of space in there for a lot of battery. Um, That, of course, adds to the cost, so I would have to assume it's not all battery. Mm. Um, But, yeah, it looks... For for that sort of money, as Joe said, it is similar to a Raspberry Pi. Uh, in the you know quad core 1.2 gig 64 bit, but uh, yeah, that extra gig of RAM is going to make a, a hell of a lot of difference. Well, I'm very much looking forward to getting one of these as and when, and as soon as I do, I'll uh, report back on it. But let's move on and talk about K itinerary. We talked about it last time, I think, uh, and they've got another call for data. They do, and uh, essentially they have a wiki page there with a matrix of the various airlines, train companies loads of things even restaurants that you can uh, submit or report back how those places use um ticket information and timing so that uh kmail or well rather the library that kmail will use or any email program it's not restricted to kde apps at all and um, but anything that uses the k itinerary library will be able to parse that info and then make sense of it the interesting thing was I had a look at that wiki and I said, oh, Aer Lingus, the Irish carrier, isn't on it. So I said, I wonder if I send them a ticket and booking reservation, what would happen? And uh, as of this afternoon, it now supports it. Yay. Wow. (laughs) So, I mean, talk about quick. I mean, we're only talking a few hours here, but um, watch as I now butcher his name. Uh, Fulker Krause? Mm, Maybe. Uh, Sorry. Um, So he is very responsive to to stuff obviously so if you don't see your travel provider or favorite thing there they want you to get in touch and if you can give them the actual tickets and stuff um because uh the tickets that Aer Lingus use actually use vector graphics for the barcode which is the right thing to do but it's it's fairly rarely used so they they can't extract that yet but the the whole booking reference stuff is now in there for Aer Lingus stuff so yeah I would say if you use any form of transport, <laughs> fire it to them. So is the idea with that then that the barcode has sufficient information in it alone that they don't have to bother like trying to OCR the text or something like that? They can just take that barcode data and extract the relevant flight times or flight numbers from, from just the barcode? Yeah, the, the airplane stuff is kind of handy because that, that is actually standardized by IATA, um, the Aviation Authority. But, you know, things like train companies, they aren't. So they're kind of 
using multiple avenues to try and get the info. You know, it'll try try the barcode. If that doesn't work, it'll try and parse the data and, uh, you know, use an OCR if it needs to even. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, it's pretty cool the way it works. And, you know, it's not just a KDE app. So don't feel the need to avoid it if you're not into such high quality software as that. All right, well, let's talk about the biggest news of the last couple of weeks. I am not very enthusiastic about this, but it seems everyone else is, so let's talk about it anyway. And that is that you can now play loads more games on Steam for Linux because you can play a bunch of Windows games thanks to Steam Play and a thing called Proton, which uh, has been perhaps disparagingly compared to Electron (laughs) in terms of this is like the Electron for games. I don't know about that, but either way, you can play loads of cool proprietary Windows games on your Linux box. Yay. Well, I think this is very exciting for Linux gamers. I've noticed on social media and in the press, for example, Jason, who writes on Forbes, has been writing about uh, gaming on Linux quite a lot recently. And the general sort of thrust behind it seems to be that people who are running Windows 10 on their machines just to play games, or primarily to play games, are getting to the point where they're so fed up with the updates happening that they're looking for an alternative operating system. And if Linux can be that, then I think that's great news for everybody that uses Linux. Um, More people will be interested in porting their games. And maybe with this sort of technology and the uh, DirectX to Vulkan conversion libraries, maybe they don't even have to put that much effort in to port their games to Linux. It will just work out of the box. And then that's like one less reason to have Windows installed in your machine. So I, I'm quite excited about this, and I think it could be another real benefit for, for Linux, the, the Linux community and Linux users in general. But what about the argument that now there's less incentive to write games for Linux natively? I think that's a good point, but I think um, performance is likely to take a hit, and those publishers are going to likely get the poor reviews as a result, so they'll still have the incentive to do a native port or at least build their the next generation of their games technologies using APIs they can simply compile across Linux because they'll see that people are interested in using it. Well, one of the good things is that if you're playing these games via this new system, they are going to report as being played on Linux rather than on Windows. And so if people use it loads, then perhaps that will prove that there is more interest in gaming on Linux than people thought there was before because those titles were just simply not available so people had to boot into windows to play that i mean i agree completely with will and and personally as well i love even though it's very niche at the moment but virtual reality vr steam vr works okay on linux but there's a real lack of titles and this also enables all the vr titles to work on windows to also work on linux Fail him. I know you only ever play Flight Gear, so presumably you don't give a shit about this. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I can't deny it really, but uh, I do like games, and it's probably actually one of the few areas of software where I'm not as concerned about it being closed. Um, because I, I think a game to me always seems a bit more like a work of art than something that you actually need to keep going with, unless it is a simulator where you know it's kind of cool to be able to keep going with the thing. But a game is kind of like a fixed in time snapshot and it's a finished product usually so i'm less concerned with them and you know as long as it's emulated in the future when the latest what is that chip that you keep going on and on about risk five when all our cpus yeah runs risk five and there's no more they're gonna have to have like x86 emulators as long as we can do that then i'm kind of happy with a game just being a little black box that you play and have fun with um so i think this is great i think it is really cool because um you know, if people who were being held back by the excuse of not being able to play the odd game here and there don't have that anymore, I think that's great. So Valve have invested a lot of money in this. They've been working with Code Weavers for two years on it, so it must have cost them a fortune. And you wonder why have they done that? What is the incentive for them? They're doing perfectly well selling their titles on Windows, and the vast majority of what they're selling is Windows. So why do they suddenly care? I mean, they cared about Linux as a as kind of hedged bet, didn't they, against um, whether future versions of Windows would not allow you to install whatever you wanted and you'd have to go via the App Store. But that turned out not to be the case. So what have they seen here that that we haven't? Because it seemed like the Steam boxes were dead. It kind of still seems like that, doesn't it? And SteamOS 
we haven't seen huge developments there. So what, I, I just don't get this. Why, why are they investing all the money? I think some of it probably comes down to control, that they can be masters of their own destiny on SteamOS, on versions of libraries that they're shipping, on um, the exact technology stack, on how easy it is for them to make low-level modifications you know, down at the driver level um, versus Windows, where you get what you're given to a certain extent. So I think there's there's still a, a certain amount of hedging going on, um, and that is so that they can be masters of their own destiny rather than be dictated to by uh, by what Microsoft give them. I have a suspicion that Windows might be trying to redevelop itself um, to the point where it's not going to be any more difficult to be on a completely new platform either way, whether it's Linux or Windows. And maybe they just don't want to be caught out by that in case it happens faster than expected because... You know, there's a lot of rumors that were going around of of backwards compatibility finally being dropped. You know, it's that this long held opinion that you know if they only did that, they could make Windows good. But yeah, it would kill every single piece of software out there. I don't know, or they could be just good guys. <laughs> there's the other theory, which is a Windows going to a software as a service approach, and then gaming going to a software as a service approach. I haven't really thought this through, but could software as a service for games? affect the baseline for for Valve, for Steam. If you are renting your games, then why would you need to rent them through Steam? Perhaps if Windows does go software as a service, people will still want a method of owning that physical game on their machine that they're in charge of, rather than just have it streamed from the cloud from the various uh, software houses. Yeah, or you're going to be, you know, in the Windows store and that's it, you know, mm. fully walled garden approach. I don't know. Yeah. Good point. Or oh, the Fortnite approach. I mean, th- this has brought up this whole debate now about app stores from Apple and Google taking 30% of your either the money that people buy your game for or the in-app purchases or whatever. But Fortnite is not available on Steam. It's not available on Google Play. You just have to go directly to Epic Games to get it. And so I suppose it could potentially be a hedge against that move as well. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, I don't care about games, so let's move on and talk about the Commons Clause. I saw a big stink about this online, and uh, Redis is being uh, re-licensed. Um, it's not open source anymore. I think you put this in Phelium, didn't you? I did, yeah. I kind of. It couldn't have been the perfect example of how I think that uh, the BSD license is a really terrible idea, epitomized in one single story. Fair enough. I don't overly care about Redis that much, but it's the principle of the thing where they didn't like people using the license as the license is intended and making money from their product, got in a huff and then changed the license so they couldn't do it anymore is a very cynical view of it maybe. But one one point struck out at me a bit where they said people had violated the ethos of the license. Well, so no, they were following it exactly as they were supposed to. I, I thought exactly the same thing. In fact, a lot of the terminology and phrasing that they use is a bit like, you know, newspeak. Commons clause itself seems a bit like newspeak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what this commons clause is, is pretty much this is a permissive license and you can do whatever you want with it except make money. And therefore, it's not a permissive license anymore. And they should have just used a more restrictive license. To help me understand this, I've read it and I'm not sure that I understand it because it seems so outrageous that I think I must have understood it wrong. But they're saying that um, the, the license now means that you can't set up a consultancy who advises on how you go about using Redis and how you install it, how you configure it, all of that kind of thing. Is that right? Well, I think... Joe's favourite term comes to mind, I anal, <laughs> or I anal, as he says. Uh, yeah, it looks like if you, what's the term they use? Entirely or substantially make money from the product. So, hmm. I mean, it is only plugins, it, um, albeit very useful plugins that they've changed the license on. The core is still BSD, but I guess you could still use that as the way to... Um, consult but yeah i mean it just raises questions all over the place and it's not an osi license anymore i mean they they spend an entire paragraph talking about how very like an osi license they are but they aren't an osi license as they have to point out in one sentence so 
I mean, if you're okay with that, fair enough. But I just at that point, why don't they just make it proprietary? It'd be a bit more honest, wouldn't it? it yeah, it would, because they say that technically we're not open source with these plugins, but uh, you can still see the source code, and so we, we're pretty much as good as. But it's not that. It, that's not the point of these licenses. So it just seems a bit outrageous to me that they would try and do this. But it's up to them, I suppose, to license it however they want. Yeah, and, and all, it kind of feels like if you were to look at that code and you then end up producing something or working for somebody later on who's got a similar type of thing, are they going to come after those people later? Because they said that you've now, was it tasted the tainted fruit or what the hell it is? <laughs> <laughs> I do have some sympathy with the problem. I mean, those of us who have kind of followed Cute for its duration with KDE, you know, it's had its ups and downs and it's flirting with proprietary licenses and modules. It wasn't so long ago that, you know, the optimization stuff and the data visualization stuff was a separate proprietary module. And, and of course, Cute in the very beginning with the KDE desktop and GNOME caused, caused that initial kind of fracture. But after all this time, it's it's disappointing that some people, especially people who work within open source, seem to think that this is going to work, this is a solution, and it's probably going to push people more the other way um, and cause them problems. There were some interesting comments on the um, in the LWN version of this story where also um, Redis Labs was getting, it, it's almost at the same time as a funding round. And, you know, this is purely conjecture, but you don't know whether investors have that idea of what open source is and how it should be how it should be used and whether they've you know succumbed to pressure from investors to include this clause all right well that's enough boring license talk let's talk about gnome and they famously removed desktop icons a while back and you had to use plugins to bring that functionality back but now it seems that they are seriously contemplating bringing them back properly Ah, the old classic Coke marketing routine. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is generally encouraging news. You know, they they said they were going to get rid of them for various reasons. Um, they were broken and unmaintainable and that sort of thing. Um, people, the, the people spoke and they said that they wanted them back again, and so they've sort of re-implemented them properly in inverted commas. Uh, so yeah, good news. This is good news because. Um, I don't particularly use desktop icons, but whenever I go to somebody's non-technical computer, whether it's running Windows or OS X or whatever it is, their desktop is always littered with hundreds of icons, and I always <coughs> want to do that. <laughs> I actually discovered that in XFC you can make the icons smaller. <laughs> I found that out when my screen was completely full. And so now I just keep doing that every time it fills up, just make them a bit smaller, make them a bit smaller. <laughs> I bet you don't even put text on them because that would use up even more space. That's just a series of blobs of two pixel wide color. Yeah. Well, I can see where the design theory came from. And it, that is looking at people's desktops and going, oh my God, what have you done? How do you live like this? And then trying to help them be tidy. But the reality is, it's so much quicker to find them when you know where they are. You know, they're there on the desktop. You don't have to open a separate File Explorer app and then drill down into a very tidy, organized folder structure. So I think it's, it's encouraging that the the real world use cases uh, have obviously had that much um, influence on them that they've decided that it is not such a bad idea after all. Not to mention the fact that removing desktop icons breaks the entire metaphor for a desktop. The whole point of it is, you know, I'm looking at my desktop now with loads of crap all over it, and then I look at my metaphorical desktop on my computer, and it is the same. You know, I, I just don't understand why they did it in the first place, but at least they finally come around. Um, all right, so Digium, who make Asterisk, are being bought by Sangoma. I don't really know what any of this is about. Phelim, you use Asterisk on a daily basis. What What's the uh, significance of all this? If you don't hear from me in a few months, because this all went terribly wrong and what I make my money from has all gone down the tubes and I'm probably selling washers or something like that. Um, but yeah, Sangoma, a company who used to make telephony cards and stuff like that, a can Canadian company, I believe, um, they were one of the big 
sort of hardware manufacturers. They also did software too. Um, they even end up buying free PBX, which is this, in my opinion, horrific web interface for Asterisk. I just don't like what it does with the config, but that's just me. Um, they bought that a few years ago, and then they have now actually purchased Digim, the company who makes Asterisk, which when I read it the first moment, I had a minor heart attack, but it looks like it's going to be great in the sort of vein of Red Hat getting uh, buying CentOS. Not quite, but yeah, sort of. A bit of conglomeration, I guess, but uh, in a good way. Um, and nothing is going to change at all this year. And I think going forward, I think they'll actually be a good fit because they, they understand and they get how the old open side of things works. And I don't think they have any means to make it close. So I think it's just a good backing. So it's I think Digim maybe weren't doing quite as well as they wanted to because it's quite a hard market making phones and telephony gear, especially with things going SIP and people wanting apps on their phone and things like that. Um, but, you know, Astros itself is a fantastic product. So it's good to see this because it's essentially investment in Astros. So it's good. I'm slightly concerned by it and in, in from a hobbyists involvement in and in, in asterisk um when i poke around on their support site and then the free pbx support site as well there is a common thread through those which is if you're using one of these third party um tdm voice interface cards well good luck to you we're not supporting you go ask somebody else and it worries me that now they own asterisk and free pbx that it's going to really lock down the ecosystem purely to their hardware cars. Now, obviously, that's good for them. That's make good good business sense. Um, but it does make me a little bit concerned for for the sort of hobbyists out there who don't want to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on their specific cards and um, and now are sort of left to their own devices. Quite literally. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, mind you, I think the Digim, uh, the daddy drivers and stuff like that are quite good in the fact that there's a lot of kit out there you can buy, even secondhand, especially if you're doing analog stuff. Um, and even some of the PRI or BRI digital cards um, that you could pick up uh, secondhand. Or, I mean, I can understand if you're if you're using it at home, you maybe want to have a, you know, not spend too much money on it. But for if you're really doing serious stuff with it, a lot of the problem is that you would buy, you know, crappy cards and then it's very hard to tell where those problems are going but i to be honest i would be not surprised entirely in 10 years time there's no telephony cards left because i think those days are slowly fading as sip becomes the default protocol and is reliable and people have internet connections that are both fast and low on latency you know there's a lot of providers that you can get that they'll hook you almost straight into a data center with you know one or two hops and you know happy days there so ISDN definitely on the way now, even in, in telephony. I think telephony is probably the last bastion of um, ISDN connections. Just dealing with the bloody telco companies is enough to actually, I mean, I used to be youthful once. Though that has been long beaten out of my system. <laughs> All right, well, an actual modern phone implementation <laughs> is Ubuntu Touch, and they have finally released OTA4, which is based on 1604 rather than 1504. Okay, it's not 1804, but at least it's still supported for another few years. I think we talked about it when the release candidate came out, but this is massive news for them. This is what they've been building up to ever since Shuttleworth dropped the bombshell and they had to quickly regroup. All their plans are based on it moving to 1604 first. So it, it's really just sort of congratulations to them for finally getting here. Why is my phone not on it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, because you've got a too modern phone. If you'd got the OnePlus One, you could have flashed it on there. Ah, this is this is as bad as seeing all the Samsung S3 stuff that was coming out well ahead of my OnePlus 3T when I broke my S3. It's like, oh, why can't I never have the right phone for these things? Yeah, I got my S3 back. I lent it to someone. Uh, I haven't even tried it yet. I think it's a bit more broken than when I gave it to him. But I can... Uh, install uh what's it called again the, the totally free one replicant so i can install that and see how terrible that is again very i'd imagine yeah but yeah, this is really cool um you know we're waiting for the Librem 5 whether or not they'll actually deliver that purism remains to be seen but we actually have a proper linux based os for a fair number of phones to be fair and i think uh, one or two tablets as well and, uh, you know, this is properly GNU slash Linux running on mobile hardware. So 
Yeah, it's pretty cool. It'd be awesome. Okay, this episode of Late Night Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. Go to do.co slash LNL, that's for Late Night Linux, and you can get $100 credit to get you started, and you've got 60 days to use it. They offer tons of different services, but the one that I've used mostly is the Droplets, and they are VMs with full root access. And they've got various distros that you can use with them, Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian, CentOS, and even FreeBSD. And they've also got specialist container distros, uh, CoreOS, Fedora Atomic, and Rancher OS. And these are available in data centers all over the world, and they've all got great super fast networking and super fast SSD storage, so you're going to get great performance no matter where you spin up your droplet. But apart from just the distros, they've got loads of one-click apps, like they've got basic LAMP and LEMP stacks, you can have WordPress or Discourse or GitLab. And even if you're setting it up for someone who's not as technical as you, they've got PHP MyAdmin and loads more as well. These droplets start for as little as $5 a month for one gigabyte of RAM and 25 gigabytes of disk and one terabyte of transfer. But they go all the way up to 192 gigabytes of RAM and 32 CPUs and just ridiculous transfer and disk space. But they've also got CPU optimized droplets if you're just looking for pure performance. And storage-wise, they've also got block storage or object storage, depending on what you prefer. And that is really easy to deploy. You just pick exactly how much extra storage you want. Just add it to your droplet. You can also schedule automatic backups, just in case anything goes wrong. And one of the most impressive features is cloud firewalls, which means no messing around with IP tables, not even UFW if you don't want to. You can just do it before the traffic even hits your VM. So go to do.co slash LNL and get $100 credit to get you started. On to a bit of admin then. First of all, thank you everyone for supporting us on PayPal and Patreon. It's very much appreciated. You can go to latenightlinux.com slash support to find ways that you can support us. Um, don't forget the $5 reward on Patreon. You can have an ad-free experience. Um, and go to latenightlinux.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. I was extremely hungover last time, uh, having just come back from Og Camp, and I said that I would probably put out the live show the following week. Well, I did. I was true to my word. Uh, that went out on the Late Night Linux Extra feed and obviously on the All Shows feed, so you may have missed that. I'll put a link in the show notes there. Uh, have a good listen to it. It's pretty cool because we had Dan Lynch on there, um, uh, among others. I won't name everyone now. Dan gets a special mention because we haven't seen him for ages. Yeah, great to see him back. Yeah, it was. It was really great. Uh, so yeah, check that out. Um, and also, I completely uh, dropped the ball, as the Americans would say, last time and did not mention Bug Report. So um, what is it? Bugreport.co.uk uh, with no HTTPS, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've bugged Ben. I've bugged Ben about it. <laughs> well, they have to have their first bug log, so there yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and your third episode is called Linux Means Linux, which is uh, funny. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, obviously this was Linux Voice. I don't suppose anyone doesn't know. Uh, well, it, no, it wasn't. No, sorry, that's wrong. It wasn't Linux Voice. It just happens to be the people who were doing a podcast called Linux Voice, and it happens to be the exact same format. Yeah, without a voice of the masses, because we're just not that organized these days. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you should start announcing the uh, voice of the masses on this show. <laughs> 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 But um, yes, so Graham, you're doing a podcast again. Does that mean you're leaving this show? No, not at all. I'm, I'm really enjoying it here. It's it's great and it's quite different. Um, I try not to mention Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just depresses me when you do, but it's funny when you guys talk about it a lot on Bug Report. Um, it's funny that so someone I know... Uh, who is a pro Brexiter? I wonder who that could be. Said that like, no, I don't like listen to that anymore. I'm always going on about Brexit. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I think you've lost at least one listener. <laughs> I, think I said last time that our listenership's down fifty-two percent. <laughs> yeah, funny that. <laughs> yeah, so bugreport.co.uk. Anyway, I'll link to it as well in the show notes. But yeah, go go check that out. Um, you have had one or two audio issues. I think it's fair to say, but uh, you're working on that, aren't you? Yeah, we will get back to our original quality, which is always fair. But yeah, we're all a bit out of practice and uh, we're still trying to find our feet. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, this episode of Late Night Linux is sponsored by CDN77. Go to cdn77.com slash LNL. That's for Late Night Linux. And they are a UK-based CDN provider with a standalone live streaming platform. And apart from sponsoring loads of open source projects like CentOS, KDE, Fedora, and Gentoo, one of their main clients is the European Space Agency, 
who use CDN77 to deliver Hubble images all over the world. They're a real innovation leader. They were the first CDN to implement HTTP2 and Brotley compression. And everything's developed in-house, including their own DDoS protection. And they can push 80 gigabits of live streaming traffic through just one server through optimizations. And this CDN consists of over 500 servers all running Debian, and only a few of them are VMs. The vast majority of them are physical servers. And they've got 30 points of presence all over the world in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia, with over 7 terabits per second of network capacity in total. They've got excellent 24-7 live support, and you can either go pay-as-you-go, or they've got monthly pricing plans. Either way, there's no commitments and no hidden costs. And if you go to cdn77.com slash LNL, you can get a 14-day free trial with no credit card needed. And then if you do stick with them, you'll get an extra 10% on top of their first payment bonus. So go to cdn77.com slash LNL and start delivering your content. All right, so we're going to end with an interview that I did uh, last week, I think, uh, with VM Brazua. Uh, I would pronounce it Brasua or something, but that's what she said. Um, Vicky is her real name, but everyone calls her VM apparently. Um, and she has got loads of experience in the industry. She's been um, in the world of free and open source software for 30 years, which is uh, quite a long time, and working in the industry for 20 years. Um, she's the vice president of the OSI, um, and she's won various awards and things. So uh, I suppose without further ado, let's hear that now. So welcome to the show, VM. Well, hi there. Thank you for having me. So you've got a book to plug, so let's get the title of that out of the way first. So what's it called? It's called Forge Your Future with Open Source, and it's the very first ever book on how to contribute to free and open source software projects. Well, that we will come back to, whether it is indeed the first a book of its kind. But um, what's it about then? It's about contributing to open source, as the title says. It is, exactly. It's it's just what it says on the tin. Um, it's uh, While it's applicable to all types of uh, contributions, it does not focus on programming solely because in order to have a successful software project, you really require a lot of different roles. And so do you really think that this is the first time this has been written about in a book? I mean, I had a quick look around earlier this afternoon and I saw quite a lot of um, articles and quite lengthy pieces. I couldn't actually find a book. I mean, did you do some solid research to to kind of make this claim? Well, first of all, I have been in free and open source software for about 30 years. So I've got a fair bit of experience there. Um, and had this book existed, I would have known about it. But as part of the book proposal process, one of the things you have to do is market research and seeing what else is out there, what are the competing titles, what sorts of things cover this type of ground already. And while there is an excellent book about how to release open source software by Carl Fogel, and I highly recommend people look that up, there hasn't been anything about the other side, how to contribute to. And I I personally did a lot of research. Um, I have 10 years of experience in library and library software, so I'm very good at searching. And then my editor and my publisher also did their own research, and none of us could find anything. Oh, interesting. Because the first book that uh, jumped to my mind was The Art of Community by John O'Bacon. I don't know if you've read that. That's not necessarily about contributing to open source. It's more about kind of organizing your community around free and open source software. Yeah, that's a different side of things. So um, it's it's kind of like uh, Carl's book is one piece of the puzzle. Jonah's book is a different piece of the puzzle. And my book is a heretofore missing piece of the puzzle that we can now have. And we're slowly but surely starting to put together all together because, you know, it's a community, right? This is what we do. We all contribute our bit. Um, so we're starting to form a complete picture of free and open source software in this way. Okay, fair enough. So you say you've been in this world for quite a number of years. On your website, you say 30 years there. Um, so what have you been doing? What what has been your involvement? Um, what are the highlights, I suppose? Obviously, I can't expect you to tell me a full 30 years in a, a short interview. But yeah, what, what are the kind of main claims to fame or the main experience that you've had there? It has mostly been on the uh, kind of supporting side of things. I like to think of myself as free and open source software minister without portfolio, which makes a lot more sense to people in the UK than it does when I say it to people in the US. Um, 
I haven't been a part of any specific large free and open source software project. So a lot of people will identify as uh, Debian people or Apache or Eclipse. Um, I have been kind of helping across the board and it's one of, it's been very useful because when I go to speak at free and open source software events, I get to interact with everyone. I don't just stick with one little piece of the community. I interact with all of them. Uh, and most recently, I guess if you're looking for accomplishments, I became vice president of the Open Source Initiative, which is a pretty important thing, I think. Yeah, that is quite prestigious. Um, that's interesting. That that's kind of how I feel in this community. That I don't necessarily belong to one. Uh, you know, I use Zubuntu, so I'm kind of part of the XFC community, part of the Ubuntu community. But yeah, I, I'm not kind of. I don't have any allegiances there. Um, I feel more independent. So yeah, I can sympathize with that. Yeah, it's been super convenient because I do get to hear problems that everyone is having and advise on them. And I'm able to say, oh, you're having that problem. Well, this person over in that community had a similar problem. So you should talk and I can introduce them. And there are people who otherwise wouldn't typically meet in their circles. So it's very convenient to help everyone learn and grow together. Yeah, and presumably you took that experience and applied it to the writing of this book then? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the book, while it does make recommendations for, hey, here's how you do these things, at every point it says, okay, well, this is the way you're most likely to see it, but different communities handle things differently. So always confirm. So it's not like a very firm carved in stone, this is the only way to do it, because we all know that's not it, right? Free and open source software doesn't operate that way. Every community has its own needs and its own requirements and its own risk profiles and will handle things differently. And so you go through in the book um, the kind of origins of open source and the difference between open source and free software. Um, and then you get into the actual how to contribute, the meat of the book. Um, I, most people listening will know about the, the basics and the history of it. So in terms of contributing then, clearly if you are a coder or a programmer, then you'll be able to contribute in that way. Um, people know about translation and testing. Um, what are the other kind of main ways for people to get involved then? There are so many different ways, and there's an entire chapter which is just about how to contribute without making a pull request, essentially, with, without using version control at all. We are, we're communities, we're composed of people, and in order to make that work, you need folks who will help contribute on that way as well, so who will um, help organize events, who can run meetups, who can do marketing for your project, because if you release it, it does not necessarily mean they will come. Uh, folks who will do design for your project or usability. Testing is very important, but testing isn't only unit and integration tests. Testing your documents, are they even useful? Is it uh, for somebody coming in who's never looked at your project before? Do your documents, are they meaningful to that new person? You know, so there are lots of different ways that people can get involved that don't necessarily require knowing how to program. And presumably you have a fairly pragmatic approach to all of this and you're not one for kind of uh, free software zealotry. Oh, no, absolutely not. I'm all for free software and I do believe um, in the for freedoms, but this isn't about zealotry. This is about getting things done. Um, and it's specifically, I mean, the, it's right there in the title, Forge Your Future with Open Source. So it's not necessarily about altruism and doing this because it's the right thing to do. Although personally, I do believe it is the right thing to do. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get something out of it. So it there is a chapter in the book on what you can get out of it just for your life, for your career, for your future. And there's an entire chapter on how to find the right project for you, because it might not be contributing to the Linux kernel. Odds are very good it is not contributing to the Linux kernel. There could be another project which is a much better fit for you personally and where you want to take your life and your career. So what are some examples of ways you can benefit in your own life then from contributing to FOSS? The biggest one that a lot of people will jump on, and I support this, is networking. You get to know so many people 
all over the world if it's a very large project. But even if it's a small project, there are folks all over the place. And you can learn from them and learn from their experiences. And then when they need help, you can help them out. And when you need help, they will help you out. It's I uh, have led software engineering departments for a very long time at the like VPD director level. So a lot of what I've done in my career, which isn't open source software, is helping folks with their careers um, and helping them learn how they can get connected and how they can move forward and continue evolving their skills and their networks and continue moving forward in a, uh, I guess, just constantly looking for the next good job for them, something that's going to help their lives. And free and open source software is an amazing way to do that. So we talked about um, Jono's book, The Art of Community, and he has sold that through O'Reilly, but he's also made it available for free uh, under a Creative Commons license. Now, I understand better than anyone that we all have to eat, but I didn't see anything about that on uh, on the website for your book. I mean, is that something you would ever consider or do you just, you need to eat and that's more important? Well, it's not up to me. It's up to my publisher. And there is a section about this in the preface. Um, so it's up to my publisher whether I will eventually be allowed to release this under some sort of open license. And it's something that I am definitely willing to talk to them about in the future, but I've got so many things going on right now that this is just not something I need to add to the complications of my life. Uh, so once the book is out, then yes, I can start discussing things with my publisher about possibilities there, but it's not up to me. And so when is the release date for this then? It's an early release right now, so people can go to the Pragmatic Bookshelf and order it. I would rather you went to Pragmatic Bookshelf rather than Amazon, because not only does Amazon charge you so much more, oh my gosh, I'm kind of scandalized at how much they're charging people, um, but at Pragmatic, everything is DRM free. So I would prefer if you got a nice DRM free copy of it. So it is available right now in an early release ebook. The hard copies will be out we believe in mid-October, everything is in production right now, going through copy edits and final layout tweaks and things like that. And then we send it to the printer and then mid-October. But you can get it right now if you would like. Okay, well, thank you very much for giving us your time and coming on the show. If people want to find out about you specifically, where should they go? They can go to my website, which is vmbrasur.com. Okay, well, I'll stick a link to that in the show notes as well as the book. And yeah, good luck with it. And um, hopefully speak to you again when uh, you've got another book out. I'm really excited, but I've been told by my editor I'm not supposed to think about my next book yet. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thank you so much, Joe. This has been wonderful. Uh, that was really good to hear from um, Vicky's perspective. Um, I've got to say, I was a little skeptical at first because I was beginning to think that, well, you know, you've got the likes of the art community and stuff. And um, it was actually nice to hear from a different perspective, though. So, um, you know, and as you had said to her off air, like she, she doesn't use Linux, but, you know, I think that's kind of healthy that we have people who are into open source, not just from Linux side of things, you know, from, you know, many aspects of the open source community. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Well, to be fair, um, the, lifting the curtain, dear listener, I ended up speaking to her for about an hour afterwards and had really good chat about all sorts of things. And with regards to her not using Linux, um, she does have uh, an Ubuntu box in her place, but she just got sick of uh, the Linux desktop fucking up and eventually bought a Mac and never looked back, um, which seems to be the, um, I don't want to say older, but you know, more experienced people seem to at some point just give up and buy a Mac. So she's certainly not alone there. And it doesn't mean that you can't necessarily contribute to open source um, if you're using proprietary desktop. You know, you can still SSH out of it into various Linux boxes and whatever, as so many people do. But she's a very interesting person who had a lot to say. So I would uh, recommend checking out her book. All right, well, we'll be back in two weeks then with another episode. Until then, I've been Joe. I've been Phelan. I've been Graham. And I've been Will. See you later.